All right, hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our third Learn From Home Live. My name is Rose and I am the marketing and PR person here at Ocean Sonics. And with me, I have Ashley Noseworthy of Edgewise Environmental. Hello, Ashley. Hi, Rose, how are you? Great, thanks, thank you so much for joining us. You're and welcome. Oh, wonderful. So for those of you who have joined our previous presentations, you'll know that we regularly hold these staff learning sessions at our office, where our teammates generally share their expertise with the rest of our crew. Now, because so many of us, and not just Ocean Sonics, are working from home, we wanted to share our learning sessions with you. So we'll be doing more of these live sessions regularly, so keep your eyes on our social media channels, and we're going to share all the details, such as upcoming topics and sessions on our social feeds. And if you miss any of our previous sessions, don't worry, we've recorded them and they now live on our YouTube channel, so you can visit or revisit them anytime you'd like. So today's session will also be recorded and shared online, so if you miss something or want to revisit the presentation, uh, you can feel free to visit the recording on YouTube. So we wanted to do something a little bit different for the month of May. We're going to host a live session every week this month with a focus on passive acoustic monitoring, mitigation techniques, and marine environmental monitoring. So we're kicking off this multi-session deep dive with an introduction to passive acoustic monitoring and mitigation techniques with our industry expert, as I introduced, Ashley Noseworthy. So Ashley is the founder and CEO of Edgewise Environmental. Uh, and this is a consulting and training company based in St. John's, Newfoundland. So Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, Edgewise, and what you do? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ashley Noseworthy. I am born and raised in Newfoundland, though I've lived in a number of provinces um, and other countries. Uh, I have an extreme passion for the ocean, always have, <laughs> and a passion for marine mammals and underwater noise. So I founded Edgewise Environmental in 2018, uh, and we have three main areas of focus. So those would be marine mammals, seabirds, and anthropogenic noise. Uh, anthropogenic noise is man-made noise, and our focus is when this is created in the water. So within these areas, we offer a variety of services and products. And this includes training, consulting, survey design, and research and development. We've grown a lot over the past two years um, and been involved in a variety of projects and programs across the country. Um, and I feel very fortunate to say that despite the happenings in the world and COVID, um, that we've been able to continue with pushing forward and thriving. Fantastic. Well, we're all really excited to learn a little bit more about passive acoustic monitoring. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about passive acoustic monitoring in Canada before we get into the presentation? Yeah, sure. Uh, so PAM stands for passive acoustic monitoring. And when we're referring to PAM, we typically refer to a toad array system. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what that is, I'll certainly explain it a little bit later in my presentation. Um, and PAM allows us to monitor in real time for a variety of marine mammal species. Uh, PAM has actually started to be used for other species besides for marine mammals, but we're gonna stick with marine mammals for this one. Uh, it's been around for quite some time, so PAM itself has been around for quite some time, and it's constantly developing and changing as we evolve with the technology. However, PAM in Canada, um, specifically used within industry, is relatively new. So there are specific rules, regulations, and guidelines that observers, that PAM operators, um, and an operator themselves, so say like a large company, have to follow if they're using PAM on a project. And these are outlined in something called um, the Statement of Canadian Practice. That's the short name. Um, and this uh, document is specifically focused um, to seismic. So I'll comment on when you might want to consider PAM and other projects, even here in Canada, um, and the rules and regulations around those a little bit later. Sounds great. So for everybody tuning in, when Ashley has finished her presentation, we are going to have a Q&A session. So there have already been some questions sent in for Ashley. And if you want to know more detail about anything we cover today, you can always leave us a comment on our live stream and we'll answer it after our presentation. We will be monitoring all the channels. So if you do have something you'd like to ask, drop us a line and Ashley will be sharing her contact details afterwards. So if you'd like to contact Ashley directly, you can also feel free to do that. So Ashley is going to share her screen here and we'll hop right into our presentation. All right. 
want to make sure I, I do this correctly. Um, okay, so share screen. And there we go. How's that? Looks fantastic. All right, Ashley, take it away. Um, so I'm going to present on mitigation techniques uh, focused in passive acoustic monitoring specifically. A few things that we're going to talk about through my presentation. Uh, that includes the background of who Edgewise is. So I've kind of already given you an overview, so we can we can skip through that one pretty quickly. We'll talk about the various mitigation techniques that can be used uh, in a variety of projects, and then really focus into what PAM is. Um, I'll talk about the incorporation of Ocean Sonics uh, PAM equipment into what I have done with Edgewise um, and where I see that future going, and the use of the PAM Guard plugin that they've developed. And then we can touch on moving forward in the industry um, because there's so much happening and there and it's changing so quickly um, that there can there can be a lot to catch up on on a daily basis. So just a little bit uh, about me and my background and where I come from. So I attended Memorial University and completed a Bachelor of Biology um, there, where I focused the majority of my courses in marine biology. And I completed a master's at Newcastle University, uh, and I did an uh, international marine environmental consultancy master's, where I focused my research in uh, marine mammal acoustics uh, in and around a proposed wind farm site, which is now currently an operational wind farm site. I've spent over 10 years of my life offshore. You can see there in that photo um, on a variety of projects globally. Uh, so Canada, Africa, the Middle East, um, and a variety of roles, everything from a marine mammal observer and passive acoustic monitor to a, a client representative environmental advisor. Um, and I currently sit on the board for the Newfoundland Environmental Industry Association and the committee for the Marine Mammal Observer Association, which is global. So when I began Edgewise, there's three key values that I really wanted to focus on and build a company. The first one is competency. Competency to develop the base skills for our trainees and the training that we developed. So we have three um, main courses that we deliver. That's the Canada Marine Mammal Observer Program, the Seabird Observer Program, and the Passive Acoustic Monitor Program. And they are all focused within Canadian legislation and Canadian guidelines. So it's the competency during our training um, that, that I wanted to build, as well as ensure the competency within our core team. And associated with that is integrity. And here I'm, I'm really focused on the integrity of any type of data that we might collect. Data integrity is near and dear to my heart. And I think that if you're gonna be collecting any amount of data and if you can collect that in a standardized um, way uh, and use that in a meaningful way, it can be used to instill change or kind of better understand the world we live in. And the last is synergy. Obviously, this is collaboration through industry and academia and government. I think the more diverse you can get the group sitting around the table, um, the perhaps more meaningful the change you can instill. So there are a variety of mitigation techniques that can be used on projects. This is with industry and academia. So we have visual observation, and you see here in brackets we have MMO. MMO stands for Marine Mammal Observation. And I do have a list here, but I'm gonna focus on this one just for a moment. And it's because MMO and PAM tend to go hand in hand, specifically in industry. Uh, so you have the visual observation. It's a very um, common um, and well-used mitigation technique that is used offshore. Uh, and of course, the more MMOs on you have on board, the theory would be that you could potentially increase detection. Of course, there are some things to consider in regards to if you have uh, decreased visibility, increased sea state, um, you know, we can't observe during darkness, and the animal has to be at the surface of the water. So they have to be showing themselves in order for you to see them. 
Other mitigation techniques that are being developed or are potentially being used include infrared, so we're using heat sources and heat signatures, stationary acoustic monitoring. This might be used uh, specifically if you want to develop an understanding of a soundscape or in an environment or try and detect low frequency animals. Uh, and in this particular situation, um, you're gonna leave the acoustic equipment in the water, potentially for a long period of time, I have to go back and check it. LIDAR, which is your light detection and ranging technology. So you're using light sensing. Satellite imagery, uh, and of course, the, the finer the detail on the satellite imagery, typically the higher the cost. And radar. So here we're using radio detection and ranging. We're using electromagnetic waves. So you can see that there are a variety of mitigation techniques that are being developed and used. Um, and one of the most common associated with the visual observation would be PAM. And so PAM, passive acoustic monitoring, your typical setup, you're using towed hydrophones. So the, you can have a single hydrophone uh, and most common would be two channel. So you have high frequency or mid frequency and low frequency. You want it to be quite broadband to be able to detect a variety of species. Now, if you're going out to detect a specific species, you can use a specific hydrophone for that frequency. If you have multiple hydrophones, then you can localize. And this gives you the ability to potentially hone in on exactly where the animal is. If you have only a single hydrophone, it can be very difficult to do that. PAM is used across industry and academia for a variety of purposes, whether it's mitigation, whether it's to collect data to understand the species composition in the area, or to understand just a specific species. And there's lots of pros and cons to passive acoustic monitoring, just like there's lots of pros and cons to all the technology we use. So of course the pros, if you layer it with any type of other mitigation strategy, then of course you're increasing your ability to detect. So we can use PAM in situations when there might be darkness or low visibility, for example, like lots of fog. Um, C state, of course, you can you can sync your system to a certain depth so you're not getting the noise necessarily from the surface. Um, cons, of course, it all depends on the type of setup that you have. So you might be limited by the, the frequencies or the, the type of broadband that you have incorporated into your hydrophone. Uh, for your high frequency, your mid to high frequency, they have to be closer to the vessel or the platform or the hydrophone to be detected. And for lower frequency animals, um, if you're moving on a vessel or if you're working in industry and say you might be on seismic, that's high energy, low frequency sound waves. So they might mask, you might not be able to detect as well. And a traditional setup, so you have lots of equipment hanging off the back of the boat. You have it going through a variety of uh, different types of equipment, and I'm going to bring up a schematic now here in a moment. Um, and then that all feeds into a screen. So you can see here on the top photo, there's a woman sitting at a desk with a set of headphones on with multiple screens in front of her. Uh, and this is what a typical PAM setup can look like to the user uh, when you're inside and you actually have the system running. So when I uh, started Edgewise and I kind of looked at what we wanted to be using during our courses or what type of equipment might be out there, um, I chose the Ocean Sonics equipment. And the reason why I chose this is that it's a typical PAM setup, except you're using a smart hydrophone. So you're really minimizing the amount of equipment that's required. Uh, and there's just so many great features that are included. Um, it's easy to travel with, it's easy to set up, uh, and the students have done a great job with that. So my theory or my, my mentality has always been if, if you have if you have the same types of equipment, but perhaps less um, hardware to deal with, perhaps there's less things to go wrong. <laughs> so, uh, so if you can if you can start to streamline that, um, there's lots of features that I think are really advantageous to this type of system. So you can see on the left side we have a student, and they're setting up the hydrophone to the wave glider. You can't. I mean, there are situations where you could potentially just put the 
the hydrophone in the water, but you certainly, if you're gonna be towing it, wanna make sure that you're minimizing the noise from the surface and you wanna protect your hydrophone as well. So you certainly don't want to leave it open to potentially get caught or um, banged on anything. In the middle photo, you can see that they're setting up the Wi-Fi box. So this actually takes the place of a number of pieces of equipment that I'm gonna show you in the next slide. And then here on the right-hand side, you can you can see that there's a student um, and they're organizing this lovely bright green cable that's about to go into the water. So this cable attaches to the hydrophone, comes back to the vessel, hooks into the Wi-Fi box, uh, and then from there we can set up our uh, user station, so our laptop hook in and we can start to monitor. So the traditional approach you can see here on the top. So we have an analog hydrophone, uh, and then that's put out into the water and it's connected via a cable. It comes in onto the deck and then connects into a pre-amplifier. Uh, it goes through filters. We need an analog to digital converter because we have to remember that we're taking um, energy, that we're taking the kind of mechanical energy and we need to process that into digital energy. So I need to take sound waves that are in the water and then actually transition that um, into something that I can see on a screen and hear. From there, it needs to move into a, da a data storage unit, so however the user has set that up, and then it moves to your personal computer. So the, the approach that we've taken um, is in using the, the Ocean Sonics equipment is that we have the smart hydrophone, it's connected to the cable, connected to the Wi-Fi box, and then we hook up our personal computer to the Wi-Fi box. So all you need to do is put in, put in the Wi-Fi password um, and you're connected. So you can see it's a really streamlined approach that that traditional with all of the um, yellow in the middle is kind of filtered into that smart hydrophone. So it actually does come with data storage as well, uh, which is really, really nice. So the setup that we use uh, when we are using this type of equipment, whether it's for teaching or R&D or any type of consulting, is that we have the um, box, you can see the blue box here on the vessel, or on the vessel and it's connected via Wi-Fi to the personal computer. You can see the cable that's there in black, and we've set this up a variety of ways. So you can have an A-frame, you can set it up straight off of the deck, it really all depends on the vessel. You can see the, the cable, um, and there's rope, so that's a really important feature anytime that I have been advising on PAM systems, how to set them up, how to use them. It's making sure that you have the redundancy so that you're not going to put strain on the cable, which can obviously affect the internal components. And you also want to make sure um, that you, you don't risk losing your equipment as well, because there's nothing worse, um, especially when you're, when you're trying to collect data. Uh, and then if we move down, you can see that there are cable grips, so that can take the load. Uh, and then you have the tow fish, which is the yellow, um, the yellow tow fish that you saw previously in the photo. And then we have the hydrophone. So when we integrate the Ocean Sonics equipment, I did this for a variety of reasons. It eliminates the bulky components. And on course, I always stress to any type of trainee that comes in or anybody that's really been PAM trained is that the equipment that you use on any course, it doesn't matter, um, isn't necessarily what you're gonna be using in the field. So in industry, there's not necessarily any type of standardized equipment. The traditional approach right now um, is, is what you might commonly find if you're on a vessel or an installation, let's say. Um, and it's just because it's traditional, the way we've always done it. Uh, so I stress that when you're doing PAM and when you're a PAM operator, you have to have the ability to know how to adapt and to learn different types of equipment. Lucy, uh, so we teach our students on both Lucy and PamGuard. Lucy is the proprietary software for Ocean Sonics. Um, and one of the things that I always point out to the students and one of the nice features is that they can actually take Lucy and, and take that spectrogram and put it up on their cell phones, let's say. The reason why this would be advantageous then to incorporate into industry is if I'm a PAM operator and I'm sitting at my desk, and I need to go and eat, <laughs> or I just need to step away from the desk for a moment, uh, even though I might not be able to hear the system, I can still see it. So you're actually increasing the mitigation in that there's, there's less gaps in between those, those periods. 
But there, when I when I you started using this equipment, I recognized the need for the incorporation of PamGuard. Um, for those of you that are familiar that are watching, you're a, you already know what PamGuard is. Uh, if you've never heard of this before, it's a free software that was developed by the University of St Andrews out of Scotland, and this is industry standard. So this is typically what a lot of companies, um, industry, academia, government are using in order to process the data that they're collecting when they do PAM. So we, where Ocean Sonics developed a PamGuard plugin um, with a lot of feedback from us. So it, just to be in compliance with industry standard and be able to move this towards a system, a really streamlined system that we might be able to use in industry, uh, that PamGuard plugin was essential. Uh, and they were very quick to develop something like that. So we were the first to test the plugin in the field. Um, one of the advantages was it, it wasn't just me taking a look at this, but we've had a lot of uh, different instructors come in on some of our courses with very different types of experience and, and knowledge and expertise. Uh, and they have been able to to give a lot of feedback to Ocean Sonics as well to test the plugin. I think that's key when you're developing something is to get as much feedback as you can to develop that to the best of its ability. One of the things we noticed, you cannot open Lucy and PamGuard at the same time. So obviously two pieces of software trying to analyze the same type of data don't necessarily like one another. <laughs> so you need to choose one or the other depending on the program or the, the type of survey that you're running. Sound output initially was an issue. Uh, we gave some feedback on that, and my understanding is that the Ocean Sonics team has actually um, kind of overcome that obstacle, uh, and the sound output has been um, rectified and fixed. And within PamGuard, of course, there's also the localizing features. Uh, and we do talk to our students and, and talk to a lot of the, um, the, the project managers and, and consultancies that we work with on these features. So moving forward with Pam, where do we see this going or where do I see this going? Current practice here in Canada uh, is that there are only uh, certain times when you would require PAM, say, on an industry project. And if you do require PAM, a lot of times those vessels, say, might come with their own equipment. Um, and you hire your PAM operators, they go out, they use those pieces of equipment, um, and they collect the data as per the mitigation and standards. So my question is, what would happen if we integrated that really streamlined system into industry? Because again, I'm a big fan of keeping things compact. Um, and I think that where we're moving is towards a really great system that you can easily transport, which is key, um, that you would be able to have uh, a number of backups for, which in a traditional system can be a little bit difficult depending, there's always extras, but depending on what breaks or what might go wrong, it could be a little more difficult. You don't always have an extra analog to digital converter or whatnot lying around. So if we start to incorporate that and we start to incorporate the Wi-Fi, it, I think it would lead to um, to uh, a point where you can you can have less gaps in the mitigation if we need to step away from the desk. You can have client reps plugging in just to see what's going on in the spectrogram, which would be really neat. I think there's lots of options. It's kind of like, you know, the world is open to us if we, if we started to include this in industry. Other types of technologies and methodologies that have been featured or tested, I went through those in the list. Uh, and when I attended the um, World Marine Mammal Conference in Barcelona, a lot of those technologies were talked about. A lot of the infrared, um, a lot of the LIDAR and satellite imagery, let's say, so these are constantly being used and updated in, in different places in the world uh, and in different environments as well. And of course, I think the more that we can build on that PamGuard plugin, the more feedback um, that companies can get on these types of plugins that they develop, then of course it only gets better and better. So future plans for us, um, obviously to keep delivering the uh, PAM operator 
uh, course and continue to include the ocean sonics equipment. We'd like to see the incorporation of uh, perhaps a really streamlined system, uh, potentially tested in industry. And, and to keep in mind, there's been lots of different types of systems. Some might have been more similar than others in terms of what I'm talking about that have been tested. Uh, but I think the more that we can start to incorporate and the, the more that we can start to look at these different types of ways to go beyond perhaps just the traditional system, uh, we might break into some really interesting uh, and different and other types of technologies as well. So I want to thank uh, Rose and Ocean Sonics for inviting me to deliver. Um, this is our uh, contact information. So if you'd like to contact me, uh, you can do that through courses at edgewiseenvironmental.com um, or you can visit our website as well. Fantastic. Well, why don't we move into some questions? And remember, if you do have questions for Ashley based on today's presentation, or if you have a burning question about Pam, uh, feel free to leave it in a comment on any of our social media feeds. And we are monitoring so them so we can answer your questions live. Otherwise, Ashley has shared her um, contact information with you, so you can always direct her or contact her directly to ask any questions. Uh, and of course, if you're interested in taking any of the courses, um, Ashley uh, would be happy to tell you a little bit more about what's included in them and uh, what you can learn. So let's start off with um, one of our first questions here. Um, so in Canada, what are the criteria that a project must meet in order for PAM to be a requirement? So if we're focused on the statement of Canadian practice, um, then you would have to look at the amount of visibility available, um, the types of species that are expected in the area, uh, whether they are SARA listed species. So here in Canada, SARA stands for um, Species at Risk Act. And within that act, there are three schedules. Um, on those schedules, there are species listed according to their um, vulnerability, uh, and that's all organized by a committee called COSAWIC. So if there is um, species that are on schedule one, for example, there might be a breeding area, um, then you would be required to potentially use PAM. Fantastic. So we have another question here. Um, what happens when you hear a marine mammal during industrial activities? Uh, well, it, actually, that's a great question. So if you do hear a potential detection, then there's kind of a number of questions that you need to ask yourself. And all of this needs to be processed relatively quickly. So first question would be, do I recognize the acoustic signature? So do I recognize what's passing across the screen or recognize the sound or both? If you do, um, if it's a schedule one listed species, then you are required to shut down. Um, and so again, keeping this in the context of seismic, um, if they're operational and you hear those schedule one listed species, then you um, call these seismic observers and you get them to shut down and you have to remain quiet for a specific period of time. If I hear something and I'm not quite sure what it is, or I don't quite know how far it is from the vessel, if I have marine mammal observers, I could ask them potentially, do you see anything? If they don't, or if it's dark, or if there's fog, uh, then I have to assume a few things. So if I can't tell how far away it is, if I can't tell if it's inside a 500 meter mitigation zone, then I have to assume it is. And if I can't reasonably tell the detection, if I can't say for sure whether or not it's a schedule one listed species, I have to assume it is. Uh, and then you shut down. So how long do you have to shut down? Uh, so you have to shut down for a period of time. Typically, th there's a minimum in the um, in the statement of Canadian practice, uh, and and that minimum. Um, so you need to remain there for approximately, I believe, it's thirty minutes. Um, but what needs to happen is that they generally either need to decide whether they're going to turn the vessel or whether they're going to continue on the line. Um, and if that's the case, then if we're dealing with a large 3D vessel that could have 16 streamers out, um, that turn could take 
24 hours. <laughs> so uh, it, normally there, there, there's never really been an issue of necessarily how long, uh, but of course your client rep and your seismic operators are always keeping in mind the amount of time that's shut down is associated with marine mammals. Hmm. So we do have a question here on our Facebook feed. Um, mm -hmm. so David, based uh, from, actually from Newcastle University, uh, oh. can you know what were the highlights of the focus of your study there? Oh, the highlights. Um, so I was actually based, um, I took the Princess Royal out of a place called Blythe along the Northumberland coast. Um, and along there, they were installing, there's a wind farm there now, there are wind turbines off of Blythe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so the highlights would be, I was using stationary acoustic monitoring. So I was using something called C pods to install. Uh, and then they, um, and then we would leave them and come back. I actually lost one. <laughs> so, well, I didn't lose it, but the, the ocean took it. Um, and so one of the highlights would be really having to troubleshoot of uh, figuring out, you know, in my, in my control area, I had three C pods and now in my variable area, I had two. And so all of a sudden now I have this different amount of data and, you know, trying to figure out what to do with that. So I would say one of the highlights besides for the, you know, beautiful weather and the scenery um, would be the what I learned about troubleshooting. And I, working in the ocean, you always have to be quick on your feet because uh, so often things get swept away. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So we do have another question here, this time from Justin. Uh, he wants to know what the range detection is for PAM. Hi, Justin. Um, so the range detection all depends on the type of equipment that you're using. Uh, so what I typically tell the companies or consultancies that I work with is take a look at the specs of the hydrophone that you're using. Um, and then you have to reasonably correlate that with your mitigation processes. So if we consider Canada and that you need to have a 500 meter mitigation zone, if your hydrophone is placed off the back of the vessel at hundred meters, but your seismic guns are at 600 meters, does that make sense? Uh, and so you look at the specs of your hydrophone because each one is different. Um, and then for the detection range of PAM, you also need to make sure you correlate that. So I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't be of more detail on that, but we would end up going through a lot of the different hydrophones. <laughs> And of course, the more you the more hydrophones you have, the array, then of course your detection ability gets greater um, because they're more spaced out and how you have that set up. So it comes down to your survey setup. So we also have a question: um, What kind of animals are considered to be um, endangered or at-risk species that would require this special consideration? So that would require the shutdown of operation uh, when detected. So there are four species here off of, oh, I'll keep it to Newfoundland, let's say, that are your shutdown species. Uh, and that would be your blue whale, your North Atlantic right whale, uh, leatherback and loggerhead turtles. So difficult to detect turtles on PAM, um, but those would be your four shutdown species. A lot of the programs that I've worked off of Newfoundland, you have to read the environmental impact assessment. Um, so there's typically a large document that's drafted it. And then some of the companies might actually include other species in there. So it's been quite common that beaked whales, say, here have been a shutdown species. So while we do have the SARA legislation in terms of what you shut down for according to legislation, I always recommend to personnel that are going out there that it's really important that you focus on that EIA just to see if there's other extenuating circumstances. I also worked on a project where they expanded the 500 meter, uh, meter mitigation zone to 1,000 meters just because they did acoustic testing and said, okay, this is reasonable. This is what makes sense for the project, which was great. But if you don't read the EIA, you don't know things like that. So is it better then to, uh, to perform an environmental assessment of an area so you can know what to expect before you deploy a PAM system? 
Uh, so in the context, again, of industry, typically that's a requirement. So if, if they're doing seismic, let's say, um, an EIA is part of that process. So they would bid uh, for an area to explore. And then before they could do that, there there's an EIA that would be required. And that looks at a variety of, of factors. Uh, but marine mammals uh, and underwater noise is, is a big part of that. So our next question here, um, what are the most common marine mammals you hear when performing PAM? Uh, and I, you can comment on Newfoundland, but also um, I know you've worked all over the world, so maybe you can tell us about some of the more interesting creatures you've heard. Um, I think some of the most common, uh, or at least some of the most perhaps more easily detected, let's say, would be sperm whales. So down in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, let's say, uh, sperm whales uh, are perhaps some of their most common, uh, and they have special guidelines and restrictions in the Gulf of Mexico for that. Um, I've heard different dolphin species, a lot of odontoses, uh, to be honest. Uh, those are perhaps the most common that I personally have heard. Uh, so between you know, those odontocetes would be your, your toothed whales, um, dolphins, uh, those types of species. Baleen whales can be a little bit more difficult to detect, especially on that low frequency spectrum like we talked about, um, but not impossible. Well, nothing's impossible when you have great equipment, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, you mentioned during your presentation um, the traditional setups for PAM operations. Um, and uh, I know you mentioned the differences in hydrophones, but can you describe a little bit how you would traditionally deploy one of these systems? Yeah, sure. Uh, so once you're out in the survey area, um, again, you, you need to consider what you're out there for. So if it's an academic or a project like a geohazard survey that doesn't necessarily have a lot of other gear going off the back, you might be able to work in tandem. But a lot of times you have to have very good communication with the crew and you might need to let them put their equipment out first and then figure out how you're going to deploy your PAM, which is, which is fairly typical. So you let your crew do that, whether that's industry or academic, uh, and then you go ahead and deploy your PAM system according to your mitigation specs. And what you would do is you have your hydrophone attached to your cable and you need to wait that. So a lot of times and very commonly you attach chain to the cable. Um, you need to be very careful where you place this in relation to your hydrophone. And it's because if the chain becomes loose or if it starts to knock against itself, if it's too close to the hydrophone, you'll hear it um, and it'll actually interfere. So you need to weight your hydrophone accordingly to where you want it to sit in the water. And you also need to give consideration to how fast the vessel is going to be going. Um, because obviously the faster the vessel, the less weight, the more the hydrophone is going to float. So there's a, there's a little bit of, of figuring out where that needs to sit. You deploy that off the back of the vessel and that's always going to be different for every project. It, if it's a small survey, it, it could be off of the deck or an A-frame. If it's a large survey, I've had to put it off of one of the lead-ins for the streamers um, on a seismic vessel where you're attaching it that way. Regardless, you need to make sure that it's sitting in the water uh, correctly. And before you put it in the water, excuse me, <coughs> before you put it in the water, you need to give it a tap test. And a tap test is to make sure that it's actually functioning. So you would go ahead and tell the um, observers. Excuse me, I've got to tickle my throat. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I don't mean uh, I'm so not <laughs> um, Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I swear I'm not sick. <laughs> so you go ahead and you deploy. But before you do the tap test, you tap on the hydrophone. So you get the, one of um, the personnel on the deck to do that. You go ahead and put on your headphones just to make sure that it's functioning. Because you certainly wouldn't want to put anything in the water um, that wouldn't be able to function properly. And you've just put in all that effort. <coughs> Excuse me. From there, you go ahead and you hook everything up. You start the main system. Uh, and then you cast that to your PAM system. And then you go ahead and put in your specs of how you wanted to um, display on your um, on your PCs on your on your system. So normally you have three screens, and so I set up my spectrogram. Um, I set up for my two channels. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, and you can go ahead and hopefully monitor with no problems. Fantastic. So I guess definitely carrying around a lot less equipment um, really helps streamline that process. <laughs> yes, it does. 
Yeah, so the ability to be able to put it in the water. And of course you have to go through that whole finding out where it's sitting in the water and making sure that that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. But to be able to put it in the water, hook it up to a Wi-Fi box and be able to cast that takes away all of this cable that has to be in on a vessel, let's say. One of the challenges of that is having the Wi-Fi be strong enough to go through all that steel. Hmm. And so you might have to have jump points. Um, so there could be, there will always be testing that's going to be involved with any type of um, signal from one point to another without an actual connection. What's the um, general, like just a, an approximation, what's the preferred depth for the hydrophone for one of these surveys? Uh, if I'm keeping it to seismic, um, then generally I would say anywhere between 20 and 30 meters. Um, I always keep in mind the depth of the guns, um, the, you know, where the streamers are sitting, things like that. So sometimes that comes into play and really dictates where, where it sits, but generally around there, your system is pretty safe and you want to make sure as well, depending on the area of the world in which you're working, if you're on the Grand Bank, say of Newfoundland, it can get, um, it can get a little rough. <laughs> and so you need to make sure that it's also deep enough uh, that you would be able to ride out some weather. Um, obviously you're gonna take in your equipment if it's too rough, uh, mm -hmm. but some weather and not always have to bring that in and deploy it out because the more you handle the equipment, the increased chances of something um, breaking or not going well. Right, of course. So. I know that you've worked all over the world. You've um, you've been in a whole lot of uh, different regions, different countries with different regulations. But um, is there something that you would like to you'd really like to see as far as um, PAM and mitigation techniques and regulations here in Canada and around the world? Yeah, I think I think that we're st we're starting to see a real need for PAM regulation and mitigation regulations in and around projects outside of seismic. So there are lots of projects that are happening on the West Coast, let's say, um, where there is um, seismic is not allowed to happen uh, to the to the degree that um, that we're doing it here on the on the East Coast. And so with those projects, let's say they're doing pile driving or they might be doing academic research or there might be creating noise in the water that's not necessarily seismic. Uh, and they there's no federal regulation in and around that. Um, so sometimes you'll see uh, companies uh, or operators adopting the statement of Canadian practice and kind of just modifying that a little bit under the direction of DFO um, as to how is best or DFO might state, okay, well, here are the rules and regulations you need to follow for this particular instance. But I think just an overarching set of rules for that and renewables, it's going to be really important for us. Absolutely. I mean, as these projects develop, I mean, it's important for us to figure out how we can uh, keep these essential activities as safe as possible for the marine environment. So I really appreciate um, everything that you do as far as training personnel, but also performing your consulting work. Uh, it's an essential service. It is actually, there was an article written about that and just the other day. <laughs> so those, unless I don't see any more questions on our social media feed. So I suppose those are all the questions that we have for now. Um, so again, thank you so much, Ashley, for joining us. And if there's, for everyone who's tuning in, um, if there's a question that you didn't get to ask, or if you're watching this from the recording and you have a question that you'd like to ask Ashley, um, we will be uh, providing her contact details so you can direct them to her. Um, or you can always visit the Edgewise Environmental website or their social media feeds. So if there's a topic that you'd like to see covered during our web series, you can contact me, or you can always drop us a line on the Ocean Sonics social media channels. Um, and of course, Edgewise is also on social media. So if you'd like to learn more about PAM, mitigation techniques, or environmental monitoring, make sure you check them out. Um, and I will link Edgewise in our Ocean Sonics channels and pages to make sure that they're easy to find. Um, and if you want to revisit this presentation, this video will be available on the Ocean Sonics YouTube channel, and we'll share the link through our social media accounts. Um, before we sign off, Ashley, is there um, anything upcoming or anything else that you'd like to add before we sign off? 
Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's joined. Uh, it's greatly appreciated, and I hope everybody's doing really well, no matter where you are based in the world uh, in regards to what's happening and, and the pandemic. Uh, I guess I'll also make a note that we've started to um, pivot and turn a lot of our training to an online platform. The in-person is still gonna be very important in terms of doing practical sessions. It's really core to what we believe in and, and what we want incorporated, but at least the theory portion uh, is gonna to start to be delivered online. So there'll be some posts about that very soon. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm here um, in the loop whenever you decide to run for the training courses and we'll be happy to share them with the broader audience. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. I know I learned a lot. And thank you for everybody who joined us online on our social channels. And if you want to learn more, mark your calendars for next week because Jillian will be back with us and she's going to be doing a demo of the PamGuard software that Ashley mentioned. And then we're going to talk about some real-time detection techniques. Um, so hopefully we will see you again next week. In the meantime, stay safe, stay, stay safe, stay healthy, and um, thank you.